We're going to discuss the role of financial institutions in driving inclusive growth and transformation in Africa. We're going to bring up Mrs. Kanayo Awani, the Managing Director of the Intra-African Initiative of the African Export-Import Bank. And she's already answered 98% of my questions. So I'm going to let you discuss the re remaining 2%. She knows what I'm talking about. You can come up up here. We're all ready for you. Please give her a round of applause, everyone. Good afternoon, everybody. Toyin, thank you for the opportunity um, and to have this platform to um, introduce essentially what we're doing in Africaxin Bank. A lot of this general stuff I'm going to be talking about has already been covered by Ambassador Buchanga or, or Andrew. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I recall vividly the year was 2011 and the December edition of The Economist ran the story, The Hopeful Continent, Africa Rising. It's been eight years since then. There have been mixed reactions. We even had some of them from Andrew earlier on. These mixed reactions, the experiences have been different. But in Africa Bank, we believe that the continent is marching forward. and indeed has made great strides. It's already been said, the economic growth is projected to expand at the fastest pace in five years. According to the International Monetary Fund, Africa is expected to have an overall economic growth of 3.8% in 2019, if you include the Africa, if you include the giants of Africa, Nigeria, South Africa, and Angola. And it's slightly above the global growth rate, which is forecast at 3.7%. You've already heard it that nearly half of the world's fastest growing economies this year will be African. Ethiopia, Rwanda, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, Benin, Kenya, Uganda, and Burkina Faso. It is also said, as you've heard, that between 2015 and 2050, Africa will add another 1.3 billion people more than doubling its current population of 1.2 billion. The region has a disproportionately young population with 62% of the population under 25 years. The African middle class is projected to reach 1.1 billion by 2060. By then, more than half of Africans will be living in cities. It is my belief, therefore, that over the next 20 to 30 years, the impact that trade finance and expansion of value chains will have on Africa's development agenda must be underscored. It is against this backdrop that the theme of this summit, growing trade, financing projects, developing Africa's supply chain is timely and relevant. The importance of trade in the structural transformation process of countries, creating jobs and reducing poverty is well documented. Take a look at Asia, and more specifically, Indonesia. I don't even want to talk about China and how they have transformed, you know, and even tripled their exports only in seven years. The reason I use Indonesia as a recent example of a developing nation that faced the challenges that we, as developing countries in Africa, face, but they still managed to overcome these challenges and achieve significant growth and economic transformation. However, it is important that for trade to support structural transformation, an appropriate international enabling framework must be in place. Just to provide a level playing field and enable developing countries to overcome their structural strategies, we need to ensure that market opening is accompanied by industrialization and capacity building initiatives. 
to help African countries to produce value-added goods and services that can be traded within a continent and globally in a competitive manner. These are things we've already heard. This should be underpinned by an enhanced collaboration with relevant parties, which include governments, regional development banks, private sector, and other relevant stakeholders. A quick look at Africa's export basket reveals a continent heavily reliant on commodity and natural resources exports with limited diversification. We have heard it over many times in uh, different areas that Africa produces 90% of the world's cobalt. And you think about it in a world that is going to be increasingly driven by a battery. Africa produces 50% of the world's gold, 60% of usable arable land, 40% of the world's platinum, 30% of the world's uranium, 60% of the world's co coffee, and it goes on and on. But you already heard that the value is limited. The period that witnessed high demands and rising prices for Africa's commodities contributed significantly to growth on the continent and that Africa rising narrative. However, since 2011, the continued, drop, the continued drop in the price of oil and natural gas, coupled a few years later with a fall in price of other minerals, quickly turned tailwinds into headwinds. From Angola to Zambia, South Africa to Nigeria, the decline in commodity prices deflated growth. On average, in September 2015, African currencies were down more than 20% against the United States dollars. Corporates that were heavily invested in commodity trading and mining were forced, in some cases, to cut jobs. Some countries, companies, cut 500,000 tons of zinc production was cut down. Others suspended copper production altogether. The first slowdown had a net effect of removing 400,000 tons of copper just from the global market, just as an instance. Or an example, the shock in commodity prices refocused attention to sustainability of growth in Africa and the mixed reactions on the African rising narrative. Declining demand in major emerging economies coupled with continuous fragility in developed economies as well as vol volatility in the currency and, shrink and shrinking confidence has all called for a change or shift in focus in Africa or by African governments. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in spite of the challenges brought about by the end of the commodity super cycle, African countries remained resilient. Despite weakening commodity prices, growth momentum is set to continue. Our analysis shows that the impact of recent oil prices decline on Africa's growth was actually less than expected. In fact, the decline in oil prices had marginal impact. Africa's growth can be attributed to internal demand as well as improved macroeconomic management. Progress in economic growth and rising wealth are also contributing to the estimated 1 trillion USD projected rise in Africa's banking assets by 2020. There is near, this, this is nearly a three-fold increase from a total of 293 billion USD in 2008, according to PwC research across 12 African con markets. Indeed, Africa's traditional assets under management are expanding aggressively, supported by mega trends such as the demographic surge, fast-growing middle class, increased use of technology, and rapid urbanization. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the exogenous factors highlighted above, coupled with the political will of African leaders to, African leaders to drive Agenda 2063, the Africa we want, we are carefully considered in our own African Bank strategy, Impact 2021 Africa Transformed. As you may be aware, Agenda 2063 was crafted with a view of promoting sustainable growth and structural transformation and was introduced during the 50th anniversary commemorating the formation of the Organization of African Unity, 
African leaders decided to move away from the discourse around Africa's independence to economic and social development. The overriding objective of, that, of, the, of the Agenda 2063, the Africa we want, is to build a continent of shared prosperity that finances its own growth and transformation. In order to increase intra-African trade and transform the continent, the African leaders in 2012 adopted a decision to establish a continental free trade area. And the action plan on boosting intra-African trade with a population of, one, of about 1.2 billion and a combined GDP of over 2.5 trillion US dollars, the AFCFTA and the BIAT action plan plan sought to create a single market for promoting intra-African trade. As you have already heard, the CFTA was ushered into implementation phase very recently, last month at the Extraordinary Heads of State meeting, specifically on July 7th, after securing the required ratifications of 22 countries. Let me just therefore reiterate you know, what Ambassador Muchanga had already said. The, the AFCFTA will add impetus to Africa's growth. Indeed, various so, so studies suggest that over the next 20 years, Africa will witness an average growth rate of 7% as a result of the CFTA. Various impediments, including challenges brought about as a result of small and fragmented markets, that has been a binding constraint to the continent's economic growth and development prospects, will be resolved on its account. The opportunities for Africa to exploit global and regional value chains will become even more pronounced. It is against this backdrop, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, that we see enormous opportunities for deepening trade relation, trade relationship with the US, which has witnessed a steady decline over the past three decades, and in fact, with, the Africa, with Africa's diaspora in the US. In this context, we, we are convinced that financial institutions as well as EFIs like us can play a vital role in supporting the business people to utilize the opportunities offered by the CFTA and improving US-Africa trade and investment relations with the objective of promoting growth and structural transformation. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we are a pan-African multilateral financial institution we have 51 member countries. Africa Bank is committed to working with partners, including the US, to promote inclusive growth and socioeconomic transformation of the continent. In order to address a number of the challenges affecting Africa, and as I mentioned earlier, a five-year strategy, which started in 2017, is dubbed Impact 2021 Africa transformed. The strategy was also formulated, was formulated in the context of the end of the commodity super cycle, which impacted Af Africa, adversely including unfavorable terms of trade, liquidity constraints, and macroeconomic management challenges, as well as in an environment of retreating correspondent banking from the African trade finance space and poor state of trade facilitating infrastructure across the country, a continent, I'm sorry. It was formulated to, to join African leaders to strengthen the process of reverse engineering. Reverse engineering, the construct that has for decades subjected the continent to the trenches of poverty and, and neediness. We had to de be deliberate about our strategy. We had to be deliberate about our ambitions to transform Africa. I will talk about the, why we needed a deliberate strategy, perhaps time permitting later on in the presentation. The key, the key pillars of, of our strategy, we have four main pillars of our strategy in PAC 2021. In traffic and trade, promoting in traffic and trade is the arrowhead of the strategy. It is the bank's fifth strategic plan and it has three other related themes. The others are to promote industrialization and export development. The others is to maintain our trade finance leadership. 
And the fourth is financial soundness, be financially sound and perform well. For us, intra-African trade encompasses exports and imports of goods and services between and amongst African countries, but also between Africa and Africans in diaspora. It also includes informal cross-border trade. It's interesting that Andrew mentioned diaspora and informal trade in his presentation because that encompasses a strategy for promoting intra-African trade. That strategy is conceived on, th on three and a half pillars. One is create, we call it create, connect, deliver, and measure. The create is to facilitate capacity for expansion of production and processing capacities and capabilities. Connect is essentially to connect buyers. We will intervene in initiatives that connect producers to markets, to buyers. The deliver pillar is to deliver efficient, cost-effective distribution channels within the continent. So I will talk about it, some of the products we offer under each of the pillars. You know, um, create is essentially to create capacity for processing and production. Um, connect is to ensure that goods that are produced in Africa have access to markets, regional and international markets. And deliver is to support things such as um, promoting efficient delivery systems. People who know us know that we finance things like we arrange the syndication of, of Kenya Airways. Airways, for instance, about 2.5 billion US. We support trucks, we support railways, we support infrastructure and transportation, and even storage facilities. The measure is to ensure that we are not just talkers, but we also do us. So we, it's internal to us to measure and monitor our interventions. So, having, so as we identify some of the key constraints to promoting intra-African trade, aside from finance, finance is our bread and butter. The bank introduced a number of initiatives that are aimed at facilitating intra-African trade across the continent with a view to supporting the implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, an area, and to contribute to the achievement of Africa's growth and transformation aspirations. So you just please permit me to highlight some of those flagship initiatives. We have somewhat talked about today what we call the Pan-African Payments and Settlement Platform. We call it PAPS. The bank launched the PAPS at the Extraordinary of African Heads of State meet, um, Summit in last month. PAPS will enable intra-African trade to be paid for in any African currency. PAPS will localize intra-African trade in terms of currency, reducing transaction costs in intra-regional payments, and hopefully formalize the huge or significant portion of the around 40 to 50 billion US dollars in informal trade. We believe that this system, perhaps, will in three to four years add more than 40 billion US dollars to annual intra African trade flows. PAPS is currently being piloted in West Africa and will quickly be expanded to the entire continent. So, under PAPS, what does it mean tangibly? A trader in Nigeria can buy in Ghanaian goods paid for in Naira while sitting in his small shop in Lagos while the Ghanaian exporter receives Ghanaian CDs in the comfort of his own shop in Accra. We expect that the Nigerian can pay for his holidays in Seychelles, in CFA francs, the Egypt Air, that Egypt Air can sell his tickets to a Zambian in Zambian Kwacha in confidence that it will receive Egyptian pounds. We expect this, transform, this platform will be transformative in the way Africa trades with itself. The other, another initiative I'd like to highlight is a focus on establishing industrial parks. 
This is driven in part by the knowledge that manufacturing accounts for a lower share of Africa's exports, but is a key driver of intra-African trade. So the bank is aggressively facilitating the provision of an improvement of basic infrastructure, hard and, more hard and soft infrastructure, I must add, in support of export processing in Africa. So uh, we are supporting the, the establishment of industrial parks in a number of African countries as we speak, as I speak, with focus on agro-processing and light manufacturers. We're also working on developing auto parks in partnership with the African Association of Automobile, Automobile Manufacturers to facilitate the development of regional value chains in Africa and eventually to get them into the global value chains. It is well documented that automotive is one of those industries that are critical to job creation. We're also working with the African Standards Organization to support the harmonization of standards across the, across the auto sector. First, harmonization of standards across Africa, but also with particular focus on the auto sector, automotive industry. Another initiative I'd like to highlight is establishment of export trading companies. Market access has been a key challenge for both intra and extra African trade. So we're supporting this initiative across the, as, across the continent as lead institutions ETCs will serve as fulcrum to assist relatively small companies with export potential and integrating them into global value chain. The high number of informal traders is a sign of institutional failure and is a testimony to the fact that there is a shortage of ETCs in Africa. Indeed, ETCs play the vital role in, this, in facilitating exports and industrialization in Japan and Korea. We launched our strategy in June last two months. And what does that mean, essentially? Um, we just heard about West Truck that aggregates coffee in Rwanda. Right. What it does is that there are so many smallholder farms, of farmers of coffee in Rwanda, and who are not necessarily interested in international trade. They don't even have the capacity. You probably need to document, you know, fill a lot of forms. You probably need to get into the banking sector, and they can't. Somebody needs to intermediate. So that's why we launched this strategy. I'll even give another instance of peak farming in Africa. Probably about the peak, peak production per head, I mean swine, is about 40 million in Africa concentrated in 10 African countries. Nigeria and Cameroon will probably account for a quarter of those peaks. They all circulate within the continent, within their domestic markets, as a matter of fact. The pig farmers are small, or the farms of, they don't have the scale. They can't even export the small quantities. They don't have the capacity to. What then that means is that an export trading company, and this, this is providing a business opportunity for those who are interested, because our Frexian Bank will finance that ETC that will go into the African country, these various countries, buy up the pigs that they have to sell, and export it. The biggest market for pig in all its forms is China. China needs the pork meat, it needs the skin, it needs the knuckle, it needs the bones. That's what we tend to do. But the pig is just an example of the opportunities. It's the same for pineapple and banana. It is the same for products that will be sold in the, that will be manufactured in the industrial parks. It is the same for the fashion industry. It is the same anywhere you look at it. That was just an example. We're also facilitating, just as I mentioned, the fashion industry, the expansion of the creative economy, which we think is where we also have probably our lowest hanging fruits. So in our effort to contribute to, the, to this, 
and taking advantage of Africa's large, youth, large young population and very rich culture, we also facilitating the expansion of, the, of Africa's creative economy with a view to promoting intra and extra African trade. For instance, Nigerian Nollywood movies, an industry which directly employs about 300,000 people and indirectly more than 1 million people, gen generates between 500 million and 1 billion annually in revenues. And it is patronized across the continents and globally, especially by the diaspora. So we are working with partners in that sector, in the space, in Africa and the diaspora by providing financing products, trade and facilitation services to boost the export of African movies, music, fashion, and other creative works. Another initiative that probably interests this audience is a diaspora initiative. I already talked said that, that in, in defining inter African trade, we included the diaspora. Because we know that Africa's diaspora provides various, in various ways, provides resources, both financial and expertise that can be mobilized for the promotion of inter African trade and the development of Africa through investments, trade links, skills, and technology transfer. There are over 32 million Africans in diaspora, with a number likely to exceed 50 million if second and third generations are included, and they account for remittances of at least 40 billion annually, and they have savings of over 53 billion. Most of it is outside of Africa. Some of the key growth areas of interest to the diaspora include ethnic foods, textiles, creative, music, film, tourism, manufacturers. It is estimated, for instance, that Nigerians trade in ethnic foods with the US is up between 500 and a billion dollars. I personally know of, an Af of a Nigerian, and even though we say it's Nigerian, but this Nigerian owns uh, traits in ethnic foods and export ethnic foods from Nigeria, Ghana, and Sierra Leone to the US. It does $200 million a year. Indeed, the economic size of Af Af Africans in diaspora is staggering. If we take the collective the African diaspora, be, and if we regard it as the 56th African state, it will rank tops in terms of GDP, with this GDP estimated at over 500 billion, and this GDP per capita is higher than Africa's average. So the key pillars of that strategy, the, we have a specific strategy for diaspora, include trade and investment promotion, remittances and savings mobilization, knowledge and, and skills transfer, research and advocacy and diaspora outreach. The idea is to finance and facilitate the production. The production, not just distribution. The production and distribution of ethnic foods, ethnic-related products in interest of Africans in the diaspora into diaspora markets. So other than providing trade finance, we also provide project finance. We also have a fund for what we call FIDA, Fund for Export Development, that is able to support diaspora-related projects you know, with equity, essentially through venture capital. Also, using instruments such as remittance-backed financing, diaspora bonds, depository receipts, investment guarantee facilities, among others, the bank will facilitate, can facilitate or would facilitate remittances flow and mobilize financial resources from the diaspora towards Africa's development while they earn good returns and interest on their investments, rather. We will also use the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System, PAPS, you know, to the benefit of the diaspora trade to reduce costs associated with remittance transfers and increase as well as formalize remittance flows. 
uh, we will also achieve this through knowledge and skills transfer, through cross-pollination of skills and expertise, research and advocacy, taking a lead in a high-level political advo advocacy to influence policy and coordinating our well-targeted diaspora outreaches. Another initiative that we're also working on is the establishment of what we call the Africa Quality Assurance Centers. Many African exporters face high level of rejection of their exports to the US. Not just to the US, European and even African markets due to non-compliance with international trade standards and technical requirements of export markets. So if we're to promote intra-African trade and even, and even extra Africa trade, we understand the challenge of non-tariff barriers such as standards and the need to comply with conformity assessment bodies you know, and the requirements for international trade. Africa Bank has therefore, we have therefore impact on this initiative that aims at addressing this key trade barrier. So we will support the establishment of internationally accredited Africa Quality Assurance Centers across Africa. These are essentially testing, inspection, and certification laboratories to provide conformity service, assessment services, including training. We expect that this will enable, especially as we go into the continental free trade area, will enable us achieve enhanced competitiveness and attractiveness of made in Africa goods, improve market access and contribute to export growth, facilitate integration into global and regional supply chains, increase our foreign currency earnings, and produce enhanced quality and healthy products. As I may have mentioned earlier, the bank is working with the African Regional African Standards Organization to support the harmonization of trade standards and removal of these non-trade tariff barriers. If you recall, I'm going to go into another facility, you know, another program, what we call the African Bank Trade Facilitation Program, AFTRAF. You'll recall that Ambassador Muchanga mentioned that trade finance was, is a component of the BIAT, boosting intra African trade. I mentioned a gap of 120 billion in trade finance. He also mentioned that Africa Bank was working towards, but not quite achieving the, to close that gap. So we, we plan to contribute within our current strategic plan, $90 billion of trade finance in revolving terms, on a revolving basis. And we're also doing that through this program. This program allows us to drive the trade finance leadership pillar it is, it is aimed at enhancing confidence of counterparties in the settlement of intra international trade transactions for, for critical imports into Africa and to support intra African trade. This program is a response to declining credit and letters of credit confirmation lines available to African FIs, which is a direct consequence of rising compliance costs stemming from more stringent regulatory scrutiny of international banking activities. The idea is that a lot of, Afri of international banks easily retreat from Africa at the first time of trouble, but also because of the high cost of compliance, KYC issues. So rather than pay, pay those huge fines, they don't even want to bother. And that's understandable. So we're stepping up to fill the gap. So this AFTRAP allows the bank to, to boost our intervention capability by expanding correspondent banking relationships and strengthening our trade services operations. So the plan is to ensure that all our member countries all have access to correspondent banking services. Following quickly from that is our customer due diligence repository, which is linked to AFTRAF, which we have also, which we designed to enable international organizations, international banks, businesses 
who really want to do business with Africa but are limited by information, KYC issues. So the, we call it Africa Customer Due Diligence Repository, MANSA, to, as a need to provide a single source of primary data for conducting customer due diligence checks on counterparts in Africa. Right now, the, the, the repository is completed and it's being populated. This repository will make it possible for KYC and anti-money laundering checks to be quickly done on, counterp on counterparties, parties, thus reducing risk perceptions that hinder trade and financial flows into Africa. We are working very, we are working closely with the Central Bank of Egypt, which is actually extending trainings to other central banks and commercial banks. We expect that by the end of 2020, the platform will hold over 500,000 data sets, making it the largest repository of customer due diligence information on African entities globally. What this means practically is that an American business person interested in doing business in Africa can sit in the comfort of his or her own home in Chicago and conduct due diligence checks on their African counterparties, or counterparts. I'll move on quickly to intra-African trade fairs, which Ambassador Muchanga also spoke about, which is done jointly. This is an African bank and EU initiative, recognizing that info information gap information gap, an associated high cost of assessing relevant information is another major constraint to trade. Indeed, the persistent lack of access to market information and knowledge about trade opportunities in Africa is a major obstacle to Africa's trade, including intra-African trade. It's lack of access to information about markets, about where to source raw materials, about the rules of trade in each country, and even partners to use. The bank's Intra-African Trade Fair Initiative, together with its trade information portal, a continent-wide trade information portal, and partners with, in partnership with, I already mentioned, African Union, is significantly now contributing to facilitating the process of finding new business and trading partners and supporting business transactions between buyers and sellers in the, con in the continent and beyond. The Made in Trade Fair, we ho which held in Cairo last year, 2018, December 2018, was a tremendous success, attracting 1,000 exhibitors from 45 countries, and we had over $32 billion in, de billion in deals generated. Some of those deals are keeping us very busy at the bank. I remember a country, the government of South Sudan, for instance, through that B2Gs, there were B2Bs and B2Gs, has been able to attract investments into South Sudan. You know, um, and we are part of supporting some of those financing of those investments that are going into South Sudan. I will then use this opportunity while I'm on the, I have the platform to invite you to the second edition of that Intra-African Trade Fair, which we hold in September 1st to 7th, 2020 in Kigali, Rwanda. It's amazing how many times Rwanda has come up in this conference. <laughs> the 2020 conference, we expect to attract investments and trade deals of over $40 billion from 55 countries, over 1,100 exhibitors. This is a, a call to be a part of it, to come and see what is on offer, to come and network and meet other businesses. I think Tony were there last year, so you can attest to how that was. So I have highlighted some of the key financing and trade facilitation interventions that we are deploying. 
there are a couple of other things that we do. In fact, um, I just you know uh, highlighted. We in our guarantee we have what we call the Africa Guarantee uh, Program. We also have a number of guarantees, risk bearing instruments. One of the ones we have, which we didn't talk about, is what we call the Interstate Transit Guarantee. What does that, and somebody mentioned about traveling from different countries and paying duties across. What that will do when it becomes operational is that it removes the need to pay duties across countries, especially when you're going to, through more than um, uh, two countries by just using the AFREX demand guarantee. We also have investment guarantees, and I decided to talk about it because there's been a lot of talk about investments and the need to attract investments into Africa. While financing is an issue, what we find with a lot of, is a, li is a limited risk appetite for Africa with investors. What we will do, if you're interested in invest, invest in Africa, is that we also have what we call an investment guarantees program, whereby we will cover certain risks, we'll cover, um, in a sense, de-risk your perceived concerns about doing business in Africa, about government's action, about you know, uh, being able to repatriate your dividends, about enhancing you know, your investments. In fact, as I was telling um, one of the participants today, I said, some, you know, in certain countries like in Sierra Leone, we have been able to even guarantee the commitments of government to project promoters. So you can take advantage of, of our investment guarantee program. In closing, I would like to say that what is going on in Africa right now is actually a revolution. We at Afrexim Bank, we understand the challenges and risks and can be the gateway for US business, businesses that are interested in trading or investing in Africa. What we do look forward to though is for a brighter relationship a relationship that will be built on trust and mutual respect, and more importantly, relations that will bring economic prosperity to the African people and Americans alike. I'll, I'll end by sharing what Sonia Johnson, the American writer and activist once said, and I quote, we must remember that one determined person can make a significant difference. And that a significant and, and that a, a small group of determined people can change the course of history. On that note, I would like to use this unique platform to invite you all to join hands with the bank, Afrexim Bank, to work together in pursuit, in pursuit of a shared vision of promoting inclusive growth and economic transformation with a view to reducing poverty in Africa, because indeed our collective, our collective determination and efforts will not only change the course of Africa, but will greatly contribute to reshaping the global economic order and discourse. I know I've said finally many times. <laughs> but let me leave you, and I'm hoping that that quotation is on the screen. I talked about deliberate re reversing, reverse engineering. Because there was a strategy, and I'll read this quotation, and why it's important that we reverse it. This was Albert Sarrault, 1872 to 1962, the colonial minister of France. He says, Economically, a colonial possession means to the home country, France, simply a privileged market. 
from where it will draw the raw materials it needs, dumping its own manufacturers in return, economic policies reduced to rudimentary procedures of gathering crops and battering them. Moreover, by strictly imposing on its colonial dependency, the exclusive consumption of manufactured products, the metropolis prevents any efforts to use or manufacture local raw materials and exports, and any contact with the rest of the world. The colony is forbidden to establish any industry, to improve itself by economic progress, to arise above the stage of producing raw materials, or to do business with its neighboring countries. For its own arrangements across the customs barriers, by the Motolipa. Thank you very much and thank you for listening. Now, Mrs. Kanayo went over so many things. So many things indeed that I won't take a lot of her time because we have a jump packed session right after this. I think I'll limit myself to about three questions and uh, do the rest from uh, the audience. We're still using the app uh, for the questions, the Slido app. I'll just give you uh, the, the update on uh, where to send your questions. So the code is hashtag C645. But for Twitter, the hashtag is Trade with Africa. Now, uh, thank you so much for getting time to speak to us, man. We, again, are glad that uh, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area received the number of uh, signatories that we needed mm -hmm. for it to start. But recently uh, in Niamey, Dr. Benedict Orama mm -hmm. announced the one billion fund mm -hmm. that will be uh, to support countries that will face a sudden drop mm -hmm. in uh, tariff yeah. revenue losses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That pretty much means that, uh, well, we expect there to be losses, mm. but to what extent do you see this on the continent? There will be, you know. They, you know, remember that. The, actually, the it's we call it the Afrexim Afri Bank or Africa Afrexim Afri Bank's Africa Adjustment Facility. Right. What that means is is that we're introducing the facility to cushion the effects of loss of tax import duties, like you said, or tax revenues. From this whole, the whole idea is that Africa will become a, a market where there will be no taxes across the borders, right? Mm -hmm. So to do that, we know that there will be lots of revenues. And this is not the first time we've seen it and we've tried to provide an adjustment um, to those countries that will need it. In the wake of the commodity um, price shocks, 2014, 2015, 2016, we introduced what we call the counter-cyclical facility trade finance liquidity facility, because again, during that period, it's almost the same principle. Some countries, a number of countries lost, saw their revenues decline because of commodity prices. That facility was introduced over a three year period just to, to support either mostly the central banks towards an orderly adjustment of their import bills, which had built up and the shortage of revenues. So this is exactly the same thing. You know, um, countries will lose revenues from loss of tax revenues. Mm -hmm. We will support with the $1 billion, and hopefully we'll use the $1 billion lev to leverage other financing. <coughs> because many times you see people, and we have seen a lot of interest from other DFIs wanting to join, even the insurance market, wanting to support this initiative. Sometimes you need somebody to um, be the pace setter and then to attract others. So we're committed to that. Uh, this new fund, when you look at uh, the number of African countries, of course, 55 uh, they are on the continent. Wouldn't you say that it could be rather less if we're counting how much they could lose mm -hmm. as a result of uh, the tariff revenue do drop? No, but we don't know yet. Right. Right? Um, and obviously, we have to, that's why I talked about leveraging other capital. Right. Even in the job we do today, 
I just talked about Kenya Airways and 2.5 billion syndications. Obviously, we can't do that on our balance sheet. You know, we also have to be responsible in, in the way we learn. But what it does is that you're able to attract other financiers, mm -hmm. you know, and leverage other much more a lot of capital. And we're working on it, even with the African Union. Um, there's been a lot of interest, um, you know, from many, various quarters to support with the, to support that initiative, and so that we can use the one billion leverage additional capital. How do you compare this to the structure funds in the U, in the EU as of the early 1990s? It is going to be something similar. Yes, because also it also happened in the EU where there was an adjustment facility to support countries that will need it. We, we can't assume that all countries will need it, but obviously some will need it. Something similar. It's the same, um, we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're right. just you know, providing capital that will be sought after. We know that will be sought after. Something that caught my eye when you were studying uh, your uh, address was uh, a story from The Economist as of December 2011. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, prom the hopeful continent, quote unquote, mm -hmm. Africa rising. Mm -hmm. I want you to tell me exactly from where you stand, of course, as uh, uh, at the Afrexim Bank. What do we best on to say that Africa is rising? Africa is rising compared to what? Well, I think that question you may have to ask economists <laughs> what they mean by what they mean by that. Right. But we know from where we sit and work in Africa that indeed Africa is rising. Mm -hmm. You know, we just showed you some numbers about some, and even Andrew did the same about some countries that are on the growth trajectory. Think about how many times Rwanda has been talked about here. Right? Well, so many you times. You know, so many times. Think about you know, the statistics on um, the African countries that were some of the leading, you know, countries that in the world in terms of GDP growth. You know, that's the story of Africa rising. Think about the continental free trade area and Ambassador Muchanga's comments on it being the fastest. People thought it was going to be ratified in, in five years, perhaps, or coming to force in five years, but it did in one, he said one year, one month, one week, one day, right? It also shows political will. For us, that's a revolution. In spite of the skepticism around it, about whether it's going to work, we just know that the journey of a thousand miles will start with a step. And honestly, we are on that journey. One can always put that on uh, intentional visionary leadership that is on the African continent at the moment. But uh, let's uh, drag back a little bit to PAPS, mm -hmm. App apparently something that uh, you launched recently yeah. and uh, has to do with... Um, you know, uh, payment uh, settlements, yes. uh, where, you know, from a Pan-African perspective. Mm -hmm. How significant is this to intra-African trade? I think that will, that's a, key, a game changer right. for as far as we know. Remember that there is, I mentioned the huge level of informal trade, and I think Andrew said so the same, because when you hear numbers about 170 billion, you have to add another 50, 60 billion dollars to that of trade that is happening informally, undocumented, unregistered of people crossing our borders just to go and buy a suitcase of woodin from Cameroon. Woodin is an African textile to, to, of, uh, to Cote d'Ivoire and all of that. They don't need to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. A lot of the trade that is going on is informally. People will cross over the continent, over from, I'm trying to find a country that uses different countries. Let me also use my country, Nigeria. We'll cross over to Nigeria to Niger and vice versa to buy cattle or to come over here to buy whatever products that they need and pay in the local currency, right? I said it was, it's also a function. The informal trade is a function of institutional failures, right? Institutional failure. So what they need to do is to sit in the comfort of their shops or whatever it is and order their products, pay for it in their local currency. The seller receives, receives their own local currency. And it's not just about trade, but also services. I talked about people can buy airline tickets in their local currencies. It will reduce the FS costs, you know, that we now see, the cost of procuring. There was a talk about black market or parallel market or whatever you call it. You don't need to do that in the context of intra-African trade. You don't need to always have to go and buy dollars to be able to pay for your goods or for your services. Just imagine what it will do. You know, it's going to be, it's, uh, I, we think it's, it's a game changer, and that's why it got, it was actually launched 
uh, in Miami during the heads of state summit by the AU chair, chairperson, which is uh, the president of the Arab Republic of Egypt. Finally, uh, one of the things, again, that I picked from uh, Dr. Benedict Rama when we last spoke in Kigali 2017 was that one of the biggest hindrances to business intra-African trade uh, is uh, trade information. And uh, that, of course, among other things, uh, it was on the sideline of uh, the Afro Champions with Michael Koto. And this was a very big conversation because he says we can't move forward if traders don't know that they can buy, uh, you know, products, say, from Burundi to uh, Cote d'Ivoire. That can happen. At this time, as a financier who is also uh, pushing for uh, uh, growth and inclusion with the AFCFTA as well, what is uh, maybe in place, that has been put in place by the African Bank to make this uh, much easier? Is there some sort of a portal? Is this something that you're working on currently to ensure that trade information is readily available for African traders? I guess. And that's one of the things we believe is critical to intra-African trade. There's a lot of talk about infrastructure being a hindrance in infrastructure, and I'm just digressing a little bit, you know, um, being a hindrance in trafficking trade. We know, while we, we know that the, it, it is a hindrance, we believe that infrastructure, the current stock of infrastructure as we have it today, is carrying a trillion dollars of trade. The only problem is that why is it not carrying a trafficking trade? That's because, in our view, is a lack of access to trade information and market information. We did a study not too long ago with uh, UNCTAD you know, the, um, on the leather value chain. It was interesting because, and you'll have heard, you know, said many times that Kenya will buy raw hide from New Zealand that Burundi produces. Yeah. You know, there's no information. There's uh, people don't know where to source their raw materials, but that's. One of the good things that the trade fair did, which is the first deliverable under the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, is that it brought people could see what others were producing. I heard people say, oh my God, I didn't know Egypt produced so much. You know, people don't know that Egypt's cotton is probably one of the best, you know, but they have to go to, you know, outside the country to import, right? I didn't know that this is actually produced in Ethiopia. You heard all those sort of comments. But the build up of that, you know, that the trade fair is one thing, is also that the fact that we're developing a trade information portal. And, not, you know, and that information portal, mm -hmm. um, which will be actually launched later on this year, you know, we believe we'll have um, information on not just where, who is producing what, where to you know, source raw materials, where the markets are. But the next step of that trade information portal is to include the regulatory components. Right. So it will be regulatory information as well, you know, across Africa. Mrs. Kanayo, just because we are out of time, I'm going to take only one question from uh, the audience. And that is uh, the African Bank established Africa Quality Assurance Centers. Mm -hmm. What is the incentive for the bank to do this? Is it a government fun is, uh, It's a, it's a government function in the U.S. I don't exactly understand what that is, but uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the incentives behind the quality assurance centers? I, I mean, the incentive for us is a lot of the things we do, we are doing. The incentive for us to do is to step in, is to transform Africa. If not us, who? who? If not now, then when? So uh, I'm a banker. Why should I do trade fair? I'm a banker. Why should I be involved in developing industrial parks? I'm not just financing. I've become a developer. Right. If you get what I'm saying. I'm not just financing. My job will be to pro do project finance, but I'm even putting equity. I've become a developer. I'm partnering with people to ensure that it works. It's the same thing with the Africa Quality Assurance Center. That's exactly the same principle. Is we're trying to do a heavy lifting work. Remember that I said we're trying to do it's important to do that if we're really serious about transforming this continent. So we meet 
you understand that there are no laboratories to certify our goods. Our products are rejected in every shore, global shore, right? They're sent back because of standards. Why do we need to wait? So we're financing it. Uh, of course, working with partners, we are not the ones certifying it. We, you know, we are working with uh, you know, those who have the expertise in the testing, inspection, and certification work you know, while just you know, promoting it, probably bringing our balance sheet to bear and investing in it. That's the incentive. The incentive is every, everything I've talked about today, which is to transform Africa and structurally transform it most importantly. Thank you so much for getting time. Thank you.